ask us started. Please sit down if you haven't already. Okay, so um, I hope you are all aware that your first assignment is due this Thursday. Um, I want to just remind you that you can be late uh, two times uh, du during the semester with your assignments up to 48 hours without asking for any permission. Uh, however, I want to emphasize that we do not work over the weekend. So if you're pushing it to Saturday um, and make sure if you need help to seek it on Friday's office hours or over Piazza. Um, so yeah, just want to remind you um, of that. Um, I want to continue with where we started last time. Are there any questions uh, I should address before we move on? Okay, so um, I hope you remember that last time we talked about training a neural classifier for multi-class classification. We kind of extended from binary to multiple classes. And we covered everything from, okay, why do we need nonlinear transformations? Uh, we extended logistic regression from binary to multi-class. That was a building block to introduce a feedforward neural network. And then we looked into how to uh, train it. We basically, we just introduced the notion of chain rule. And then I said, we won't be now calculating all these gradients by hand anymore. And we are gonna be using PyTorch a library that we are gonna go into more depth uh, next time. There are a few things that I wanted to cover, some practicalities, and you know, um, there is a lot to be said about how to train neural networks properly because this course aims to do more than just teach you deep learning, which is a whole other course. I'm just gonna cover some important stuff and then when we go over PyTorch tutorial, we're gonna go back to those and see which functions you can use to uh, implement this. The, the first thing I want to mention is that so far I have talked only about gradient descent, where if you remember, we had uh, iterated over the entire, um, entire training data, and then we did the updates after every training examples. Um, the issue with this is that this is too slow. And in uh, practice, we never actually iterate over the entire data, S still do it for your first ass assignment. Uh, however, in practice, when we train neural networks, we are going to sample a small batch of data. Um, and then we are going to average the gradients computed for the data points in that batch and make the update, update with the uh, average uh, gradient over here. So, um, this is actually here, I didn't make all the revisions. I'm gonna make uh, a note for myself. Uh, make um, What's missing here, basically I'm still making the updates, um, um, making the update after every example in a batch, but actually what I should be doing is averaging the uh, gradients and then making one single update for the entire batch of data. So nothing has, majorly change in this um, in this uh, algorithm. If you're writing it down, I recommend do not write it because there are made mistakes on these slides. I will revise them uh, after after the lecture. And again, the mistake here is that instead of you know averaging the gradient and then making the update outside of this for loop, I'm making it inside the for loop. So um, yeah, um, I, will, I will make that revision uh, later. And of course, your question now might be, okay, what is this batch? Like, what is this, uh, What? how many instances I should um, uh, call, you know, use for stochastic gradient descent? And the um, the answer is, is that we don't know beforehand what exactly, there are some, you know, values that are commonly used that, you know, you can try. Uh, this is an example of what they call a hyperparameter. So hyperparameters are not parameters. Remember, parameter is a term that we use to be as a, syn as a synonym for weights. Hyperparameters are these external variables that we need to set when we develop neural networks uh, externally. Um, Smaller batches will introduce more noise because basically what you're doing when you are doing that um, uh, average gradient is 
uh, you are taking only small number of instances and they are not representative of what the average gradient would be if you had taken uh, many of them. Uh, at the, at the, on the other hand, if you would increase the batch size to be enormous, you run into an issues of not being able to fit your data into the GPU memory. And almost always you are going to be using GPUs when you train neural networks. Not always, you know, for the purposes of classes, for a, for a class purposes, if you're training a small fifth over neural network, you can get away with training it on CPU without GPU, but in actual practice, you will almost never train neural networks on CPUs. So um, basically what happens when we batch data is, uh, uh, is um, uh, the following thing is uh, we get our input to now be a matrix of batch sizes uh, times number of features. Basically all those feature vectors are stacked uh, row wise. So you get the matrix and the number of numbers that are stored into this matrix equals batch uh, size time number of features. Uh, so if you have many of such matrices uh, and you're storing the weight matrices and so on, uh, the number uh, of uh, values you want to store on your GPU becomes too huge and uh, you run into something uh, that you will certainly see in your lifetime, which is CUDA uh, memory error. And so you can't really just use arbitrarily large batch size. Um, so yeah, there isn't uh, a recipe here. Too small can cause an issues. Too large can cause issues. Uh, this is a hyperparameter. What we do is we uh, we just uh, train neural network with various uh, batch sizes. We check the performance of the development set. Whatever is the best on the development set, we then choose to test on the held out test set. So the development set is used for hyperparameter tuning. That's how we uh, call this procedure of finding the right hyperparameters. And then on the test set, you should never, ever, ever search hyperparameters with your test set because then you are cheating. You have uh, looked into the test set and we no longer know whether this new value you found for your hyperparameter will generalize to unseen instances. Um, also, what I didn't want to uh, talk about yet, but you might have heard about this, is that our loss functions, so when we are minimizing negative log likelihood, they're actually not convex with respect to the weights, which means that we don't have that nice situation that I was showing before with gradient descent, which you just have a nice valley, and by going step by step downwards, you are going to come to what is a global minimum. That's not the thing with neural networks. You have uh, these kinds of situations where you have, first of all, local minima. So if you start here, and if you go uh, downwards, 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 you come here, gradient becomes zero because it's flat, you get stuck in this local minima. And you don't have a chance to go here, which is a, a global minimum. Or we have these saddle points, which are these uh, flat uh, areas where we have a uh, decrease, flat, and then decrease. Again, gradients are here are um, zero, but these are not necessarily global minima. The good thing about neural networks is that the loss surface is such that there are many local minima that are uh, as almost as good as global uh, global minima. So this optimization works uh, in the end. This although we don't have convex uh, optimizations. So um, in reality, in practice, we don't actually use the vanilla version of SGD, of stochastic gradient descent. Um, and, uh, and before I go into uh, just mentioning some other alternatives, I also want to mention that the learning rate, or I called it also step size before, is one of the most important uh, uh, hyperparameters to set, and it's one of the most difficult hyperparameters to set. Um, uh, remember that the step size is basically determining how much do you, how big is that step uh, when that you do when you update your weight. So if it's too huge, you can do something like this and actually skip this whole valley, which is uh, nice. Uh, but uh, remember when you have if it's not if it's large but not large enough, you would just do a uh, crossing from one side to the to the other. So uh, that's an important hyperparameter still to this date to to uh, actually search for when you do hyperparameter tuning. 
And I mentioned that we don't use vanilla SGD, we use uh, these alternatives or outside, the better word to use is enhancement of SGD, uh, which also consider not only the first derivatives, which give you the direction of the steepest descent, but also uh, consider information about the curvature. Um, so you can, for example, consider um, uh, by setting some additional hyperparameter, you can tell to your optimization algorithm, hey, um, previously you made, um, you, you went in this direction, uh, consider that you went into this direction and now maybe go go again into that direction. You're kind of giving the model opportunity to go kind of back in, uh, uh, to where it previously had uh, been. And this is good in this situation when you have this uh, flat things where it has, a, imagine a ball being here on this flat surface. Uh, instead of just uh, allowing it to, it to be stuck. Once it's stuck, it can also now move back a little bit and then, you know, eventually it might uh, uh, go in the, the, this uh, direction over here. Um, so this, this um, kind of um, additional information is called uh, momentum. The issue with momentum is that it is introducing another hyperparameter. How much do you allow to uh, be influenced by the previous uh, update? You can set a high value, or you can set something that's uh, very small and becomes similar to SGD. Um, also, when there are these, you know, in a multi, when we have high, these higher dimensions, there are um, obviously multiple dimensions, and uh, you might want to have a learning rate for each one of these dimensions. So, say when you're going into this direction, you can take a larger or smaller step. And this is called adaptive learning rate algorithms. When you put everything together, then you get uh, something which is called Adam. It is the most commonly used optimization algorithm. It is, if you need to start with something, you start with Adam. It's al almost always the default optimization algorithm. It's a little bit too much to now go into the details of uh, the whole uh, optimization algorithm Adam, so I won't do it but it's incredibly important for you to know that this is your first choice. If you need to choose an optimization algorithm, you are gonna start with Adam. Um, if you look at the number of citations of this paper, it's gonna become clear. I think it's higher than 170,000 citation. It's really this one of the most uh, used optimization algorithms. So yeah, have that in mind. Again, I'm just going through this very, very quickly. Um, if you are interested to know more, if you haven't taken the deep learning class, there is a super nice book, Deep Learning, uh, where you can read more about this. For the purposes of this class, you will just be using Adam, basically. Um, again, uh, we have these issues with the optimization. Another thing um, that's then important to do is how do we initialize our weights? So do you start here? and go down or do you start here and go down will give you widely different solutions, right? This one is gonna be way better. So where do we start is important. So yeah, previously I said that we randomly initialize parameters, uh, but we actually use, um, um, okay, I should have said this as well, but uh, never mind. Uh, we use this uh, Xavier Gloro in initializer, which basically is sampling uniformly, but from certain ranges. Um, and these ranges are determined of the size of your neural network. So for example, if we are in the first layer where we do linear projection, then the uh, input size is determined by the feature vector size and the output size is determined by the dimensionality you set um, the output vector is gonna be, which is again, an example of a hyperparameter. Um, here, what I skipped uh, to say is that what would happen if we would start with uh, zeros, then we would have that issue with saturation of the uh, gradients. Gradients would be zero and uh, we would not do uh, anything with our optimization. So again, optimization matters uh, and uh, very often default, uh, optim uh, default initializer will be uh, Xavier Glodo. Okay, so I kind of mentioned this a little bit in the passing, but I'm gonna mention it a little bit more formally, uh, the idea of generalization, uh, overfitting and underfitting. 
What you are seeing here is um, same problem. Here, these da blue data points uh, is your data set. And uh, here, the problem is a little bit different than what we have been talking about so far. Instead of doing classification, here we are just trying to find a, uh, a line, a polynomial that fits this data very well. And uh, if you have a polynomial, uh, then you have uh, those weights and the degree of the polynomial basically tells us how, I will, I will use the word wild the polynomial is. Basically, the higher the degree of the polynomial is, it can be more of this you know, curvy looking um, curve. Whereas if your degree is only one, then you have a straight line, right? So for a polynomial, the complexity is determined by the degree of the polynomial. And what you should see here is that when we have a very, very uh, high degree of this polynomial, it can fit your data perfectly. And by fitting data perfectly, I mean this blue line, your current solution goes through each data point. So the loss uh, of how much we missed data points with our solution is zero. It's perfect on this uh, training data. However, if we had a um, uh, uh, sample from the true underlying distribution of this data, which is colored with this uh, orange line, uh, maybe in our test data, we would find these data points that I'm trying to kind of uh, laser point here. And your error for those points would be massive because you have unnecessarily learned a curve which have these huge increases and decreases so if we are here, if we have new data point here, the error would be this much, and over here, it would be this much. So although this uh, uh, polynomial fits your data perfectly, uh, it is terrible on unseen instances, which means its generalization is terrible. Generalization meaning how well does your model perform on unseen instances? And this situation where you perfectly fit the training data, but do terribly on the test data uh, is, a, is a phenomenon we call overfitting. So your model over is overfitted on the training data. Uh, as you can imagine, underfitting is the other side of this. Uh, maybe you have a model that does not fit your training data properly. So you have a bug and it's simply you did not learn a proper solution. Uh, then, uh, then here um, you would have error on the training data and you would say that your model is underfitting um, and its generalization is also gonna be poor. The point is that you should find something in between. You should find a model that is fitting your training data well, maybe not perfectly, maybe you still have some uh, level of loss, but its generalization is good as it is here. So for example, maybe it's not going uh, perfectly through all of the points. For example, there is some error over here. Um, uh, it's gonna generalize very well on the unseen instances because it's very true, uh, very close to the true function of this data. So this is the goal and basically, Again, we will have a bunch of hyperparameters which determine whether um, we are overfitting or underfitting. And again, you are using your development data to be checking for this, never your test data. Test data is that final, final check that you do only once. But on your development data, you can check how uh, high your accuracy is. Uh, and then if you have perfectly, you perfectly fit your training data, but your accuracy is bail barely above what we would do with a random, randomly guessing the, let's say, uh, label if this was a classification problem, then you know that you are overfitting and that you should tweak your parameters uh, such that you stop overfitting. And um, there is a set of methods for reducing overfitting in machine learning models. And these uh, uh, set of methods are collectively called regularization. One example of regularization for neural networks is dropout. Uh, this idea is very simple. So you don't want some of your weights in your neural network. Weights are, again, just number in weight matrices. You don't want them to be incredibly important for your training data, because that could lead to this situation where you, know, uh, you just try to 
fit the training data perfectly and your model forget, I mean, forgets, it never knows, I kind of, uh, you know, speak about it as if it's a human. What I mean is uh, the model uh, will not generalize uh, well to the unseen instances. Um, so what you do is you randomly zero out some of your weights to force the model to not to use them in a given uh, iteration of your batch data. And you do this during the network training at every time uh, you sample a batch of data and you do the forward pass and then you want to do the uh, back propagation, you will uh, zero out some weights at random. It's important, it's at random, not that you zero out some and fix them because the model will just then learn, okay, forget about these, I will kind of overuse some other weights in our network. Um, so the, 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 it's also important that you realize that because you are randomly picking ones you are gonna zero out, the nothing is actually zero in your neural network. You're just overriding some actual values with zeros during uh, training. So at the test time, you do not zero out anything. You return like you use the actual values and then you evaluate your model. This has shown to be very effective way of regularizing neural networks still used to this day. So you just randomly pick how, how many weights you're gonna zero out at each iteration. How many is yet another hyperparameter. Okay, uh, before I move forward with one complete <laughs> digression, um, is it clear what overfitting and underfitting generalization is? This is an incredibly important concept in uh, machine learning. So don't worry if it's unclear, I can go over it again, but I just wanna make sure we or leave this lecture knowing what it is. Mm -hmm. uh, why is MSC? Um, so, where? Let me just check the values. I'm. I didn't. Um, yeah, honestly, I don't know what exactly these numbers are. I just took the screenshot for, you know, to show the curve behavior, but, um, yeah, I, I don't even know what plus minus means here. Sorry. Yeah. I would need to check that. Yeah, I, I don't know. So MSCI, I, I suppose it here refers to the mean square error. Yeah, let, let's, I, I will check this for you. Let's just not lose the time on the detail. You had another question there. Mm -hmm. uh, Mm -hmm. No, just temporarily for that iteration. Yeah. Yeah. It's important that we don't freeze it entirely because then the model will just use, I learned, I cannot use this part of this matrix for some reason and compensate otherwise. Yeah. Yeah. It's not important, like let's, sorry to skip over this. Uh, we are just hypothesizing and it's it's not an important detail. I don't wanna speculate with, because we can easily check by reading, yeah. Yes. Uh, it can happen with any model. Um, so every model is defined through the weights, right? And through these different hyperparameters. Um, and there are many of them as we have just you know, learned. There is a dropout rate, uh, there is how do we initialize the weights. Um, then here, if you are using uh, enhanced SGD, uh, the momentum, the adaptive learning rates, um, the batch size just some in these few slides. So with any model, honestly, you can pick terrible hyperparameters and end up with a very bad model. 
Uh, I think if your hyperparameters are way off base, what will happen is that you probably don't even learn the training data. And that's an easier problem to solve. If you have, I mean, easier, nothing is really easy once you start debugging, as you will see in your second and third homework. Um, but when you know that your training loss is high, uh, sorry guys, if you can just be a little bit more quiet, it kind of throws me off. Um, if you have a very high loss and very poor accuracy on your training data, you either know that you have a bug or you have chosen the hyperparameters very badly. So you can uh, go about fixing uh, these issues. I recommend uh, always, if you have this situation, to uh, use this trick, which is you take only one batch of data and you train only on that batch of data. With a neural network, you should be able to learn the batch of data. You should literally memorize it. So the model must have 100% accuracy on the training set if your training set is only a single batch of data. And if that doesn't happen, I think usually that's there is some massive, uh, massive uh, bug. Uh, but then uh, you can still on a larger set could have full hyperparameters, then you can choose hyperparameters better and, and so on. Uh, but yeah, debugging is really, really hard. Yeah. This is also a part why we don't want to look at your code for these homeworks because going through this experience of finding the right hyperparameters and debugging and learning that can be that you simply don't know is it bug or the training procedure. Everything is uh, you you written the, the entire code right, but you didn't set the hyperparameters right, and it's really frustrating when you don't know, and no one can tell you what the issue is because it can be either of those things. So uh, only only some trip, tricks of how to approach debugging can, can be helpful. Okay, so um, the last thing I wanna mention, and uh, that's uh, this is the concerns, this is digression from practicalities. This is uh, just something relating to the question I was asked last time about uh, why do we have uh, probabilistic classifiers? Why do we, why the notion of probability? Well, why can't we just use logits? And I said that, well, then uh, if we have the probabilities, then we have a nice connection between negative log likelihood and cross entropy with our logistic regression. And I just want to go over that argument because you will often hear that we are uh, trying to minimize cross entropy, whereas I'm talking about minimizing negative log likelihood. The point is that when you use logistic regression, and we know now know that logistic regression is the final uh, layer in our neural networks, then these two things are literally the same things. The reason is that you have, and I'm here, I'm gonna focus just on a binary classification case. So what I've written here is our uh, logistic regression for binary classification. This is how we define the probability for positive and negative class. And this is our um, optimization function, minimizing negative log likelihood over the training data. Um, you could be writing this equation here uh, in a different way like this. It looks way different, but it's not. The point here is that your class labels in a binary classification, for positive class, we use one, and for negative class, we use zero. So if you have a positive instance, what's gonna happen here is minus one times log probability of a positive class, minus uh, one minus one is zero. So this whole term is canceling out, which means that you are left just with a negative log probability, right? On the other hand, if your class was negative, what you would have is zero times log probability. So this would cancel out and you will have minus one minus zero. So minus log of uh, one minus positive class, which is actually a negative probability of a negative class, which you want. So basically this term, two, two things written here are literally the same if you plug in for your true labels one or zero. And this thing over here is an actual an example of what's uh, known as cross entropy uh, more broadly in uh, mathematics. So if you have two probability distribution, P and Q, then cross entropy is defined by this uh, equation. And you can then write uh, your this formula over here 
basically is, is a form of cross entropy. If you think about um, your true label, you can write it as a distribution over the output space, uh, over our labels as a one hot uh, vector, meaning you have one at the position where the true label is and zero otherwise. And then we have learned that the softmax vector gives us the probability distribution of the early output space. So basically, if you uh, plug in uh, for P, the one hot encoding of the true label, and uh, here for Q, the softmax vector, you get exactly this, uh, this formulation. Uh, which again, I'm talking about it, which now is probably like, oh, what's happening? And if I now write it down slowly, which we don't have time for, it would all click. So if it doesn't click for you immediately, just when you come home after this lecture, just put these values and you will see that you're getting literally the same uh, equations. Uh, next time when we talk about PyTorch, uh, one thing is gonna be incredibly important. Uh, you need to read PyTorch documentation carefully. So I said these two things are equal and they are. However, when you use uh, in PyTorch uh, cross entropy, it will, uh, it will apply a softmax for you. So you need to give unnormalized values. You need to give log logis. However, if you use an NLL loss, then uh, NLL loss in PyTorch expects you to give it softmax values. So you need to be careful. Do you give logits or do you give softmax output? Small, small uh, difference just by the way that PyTorch is written. But if you mess this up, then your model won't learn because uh, the you will apply softmax twice or you will not be applying it. So you have to be careful, although these two things are uh, similar. So just to wrap everything I said here, what, what, you, what are the takeaways here? When we talk about logistic regression and because logistic regression is the output layer of neural networks, uh, minimizing negative log likelihood or minimizing cross entropy are literally two two things that are equal. So you will see and hear your instructors using them interchangeably. Uh, however, when we start implementing things uh, and we rely on PyTorch, we will need to be careful in with small implementation details to ensure that we are giving to these functions the right information that they are expecting. So we just need to be a little bit careful, okay? All right. So um, this brings us to the end of feed forward neural networks. This is a slide I keep bringing. Uh, basically, we are still talking about uh, supervised machine learning for text classification. We can learn about four components. And as I said, we are just now uh, learning more and more of uh, you know, uh, things for under each one of these um, uh, components. And last time we talked about feed forward neural network, which is now another classification function we know um, um, uh, besides just uh, pure logistic regression. And today we are gonna again enhance what we know about these components and we are gonna focus on feature representation of the input. We are going to learn something better than feature vectors that you are all implementing right now uh, in your homeworks. Okay, are there any questions about anything so far? All right, pretty good. Let's move forward then. So as I said, today the goal is to learn a better feature uh, representation of the input text, something that goes better uh, with the neural networks. And uh, once we learn this, basically, you know everything you need to know for your second homework, which is still not released. I will not release it until uh, the deadline passes for the first one. And then PyTorch will just help you maybe to learn a few um, extra things uh, for the implementation. Okay, so first, uh, why do we even want to learn other featureization? Uh, the reason why we want to learn uh, better feature, uh, featureization than what we used so far, which was basically constructing these vectors, which are of the size of the vocabulary and recording absence or presence or counts of words in the vocabulary, is that they're not great for measuring similarity in the meaning. And 
it will become clear why uh, now when we start to look into aspects of meaning we care about and we'll see a couple of examples of how these feature vectors that we have been using so far can uh, fail. Uh, knowing the, the similarity in the meaning is very important for many NLP uh, applications. Uh, if you want to know whether something is a paraphrase of something else, which is very important, for example, in information retrieval, Google uh, is not is uh, when we when you search something Google search, it's not gonna for every way of expressing your query, they are not gonna have you know. Um, uh, calculate uh, the uh, computations again, rather first step we'll see whether that query is very similar with the query for which they all already have the output stored and then retrieve those outputs uh, rather than, you know, uh, recalculating everything from scratch. So query similarity is very important for information retrieval. Then in summarization, if you have a document and you're trying to produce uh, a smaller, you know, um, a uh, smaller summary where you mention all uh, relevant information that's not redundant, then for knowing the notion of redundancy, again, you need to know whether two sentences, let's say, that you want to add to your summary, are they too similar? And if they are, it's better to omit one of them because then you have redundancy and the whole point of summarization is still reduced, uh, and so on. And I'm saying here right now that the bag of words with counts that we learned is limited in this regard, and therefore we are going to learn something better. Okay, uh, but let's first look into what are these aspects of meaning that we are not covering really well. So here we are going to learn a few terms, uh, which are maybe sound a little bit linguistic, but it's important for you to know them. It's a standard, you know, terminology uh, that we use uh, in NLP. So. Uh, here you see for a word, Bayesian, you see the output, uh, the screenshot for, from a dictionary. And under one, two, five, you have what we call um, different senses of this word. So this, this word over here is what we call lemma, the canonical form or dictionary form or citation form of a set of word forms. So uh, for example, word forms, that we can form from the lemma basin could be plural basins, right? Um, here we have uh, different meanings, different senses of the same uh, uh, word. So it can be a white bowl for washing, a shallow bowl used for single serving of a drink or liquidy food, a depression, natural or artificially containing water, an area of land from which water drains, and so on. So different meanings of a single word are called uh, word senses. And when a word has multiple senses, it, we call it polysemous word. Oh my God, sorry guys, I probably pronounced this terribly wrong. And the task of trying to disambiguate which sense of the word in a given sentence uh, is expressed is called word sense uh, disambiguation. Now, we have synonyms. I'm pretty sure you all know what synonyms are. The way you will see them introduced in NLP that um, two senses of two words are synonyms when one word has a sense whose meaning is nearly identical to a sense of another word, such as canyons and gorges, both referring to the uh, same uh, thing. Uh, and important for our lecture today is to realize that synonyms have the same meaning in some or in all contexts. So keep that in the back of your head for, for now. And here I just want to, you know, throw out this uh, interesting linguistic observations that it's really actually hard to think about whether two words are exactly synonyms or now, not. And uh, there is this thing called principle of contrast, which says a difference in linguistic form, meaning what we, the actual word we see, is always associated with some difference in meaning. For example, uh, H2O and water. Although both of these words are referring to water, you would, for example, find water maybe in a manual for hiking, uh, where uh, H2O would be something you would maybe use in a chemistry uh, textbook. And now is this difference in meaning uh, is something we might disagree about. How our bag of words with counts treats synonyms? I want to show examples, but they come as a as a not next bullet point. So yeah, let let's take a sentence. Um, close your eyes for a second. 
Okay, let's say uh, she is uh, brave and she is courageous. What would, uh, and let's say that she and is and brave and courageous are our vocabulary. How would the feature vector look for these two, uh, two words? Want to try? <laughs> you look like you are thinking, so <laughs> sorry to pick. <laughs> no, you don't need to say anything. Okay, uh, with one correction, like she, uh, she is brain, she is courageous. These are, uh, I, didn't, I didn't say independent instances. Um, so each one of them, uh, we would have basically four dimensional vector and uh, we would get one in both of these feature representations for she and is. Uh, and then uh, uh, we would have for the first one, brave would get uh, one. And uh, at the final position where let's say courageous is uh, would be zero. Whereas in the other instance, we would also have one, one for she is, but then our uh, next word in the vocabulary is brave, which doesn't occur in this sentence, we would be zero and then one. Um, and then, so there is some similarity, right? Two features are shared. And then the last one, which we know is an important one is completely distinct. And now if I, use a sentence which is completely, uh, says something completely different, like she's timid, we would get exact same uh, situation. We would get she and is getting one. Now our vocabulary had extended with the word timid. So we would have zero, zero corresponding to brave and courageous. And the final one would be uh, one. And all of these two sentences, first two sentences I mentioned are basically saying the same thing. And the third one is saying something very different the three feature vectors we are getting are painting the same picture amongst, amongst them. We would think they are basically, um, uh, the relationship between them are the same. They have two shared features, she and is, and all uh, there is always one feature that's different uh, in each uh, one of them, uh, which is not great, right? It uh, treats same anonymous as entirely distinct uh, features, which uh, is not the situation we want to have, right? If I, you know, uh, let's say you are want to detect plagiarism and someone just tweaks words by using synonyms, your approach would completely fail. Okay, and it would be better if I had these examples uh, here uh, first. All right, so uh, I said that treating is something synonym or not is really hard and it's better to think in the terms of word similarity. So not necessarily synonyms, but something which uh, share some elements of meaning. And it can be really, uh, really close, like happy and joyful. I really don't know whether those two words are synonyms to me, they are not, but they are very close, right? So their similarity is very, very close. Um, we can have belief and impression also very close in similarity. But it can be something that's obviously not um, not um, a synonym, like skiing and snowboarding. Please don't hate me for putting these two things together. But they are kind of similar. The, the sport is, uh, is uh, similar. And again, how similar two words are is important for knowing how similar the meaning of two sentences are, which is then important for our downstream tasks. Again, if you have two similar words, these words for bag of worldly counts are completely different and you would never capture that there is anything shared between them with the bag of worldly counts. Another concept we use in NLP is word relatedness. This is kind of sounds like similarity, but it's a little bit step uh, uh, removed from actual uh, shared uh, meaning. Here, um, this stands for word association in psychology, such as like coffee, cup, or scalpel, and surgeon. And we say that words are related if they belong to the same semantic field, which is um, a little bit maybe too formal, uh, which uh, and formally means they cover a particular semantic domain and bear structured relations with each other. So for example, in a realm of hospitals, so in the semantic domain of a hospital, you can have words like surgeon, scalpel, nurse, anesthetic, and hospital, and they have some kind of relations with each other. So surgeon goes to work 
uh, works in a hospital and uses scalpel uh, while they perform surgery uh, and, and so on. Uh, and similar with restaurant, you have a specific domain and in this domain you have waiter, menu, plate, food. These are obviously not synonyms and then you might not even consider them, you know, plate and waiter to be similar words, but they are related words. Again, nothing about relatedness is captured with the bag of words with counts. And the final aspect of meaning we want to care about is antonyms. So we care about whether two things are similar or whether, in other words, whether they are very uh, distant from each other. Um, so antonyms uh, refer to senses that are op opposites with respect to one uh, only one feature of meaning. They can uh, define a binary opposition or be at the opposite ends of a scale. So for example, hot and cold or uh, hot and cold are in a, you know, um, opposite ends of a scale, or they can be reversible, ascend or descend. How bag of words creates antonyms? Um, again, um, it's going to treat them as distinct feature, but in exact way, it treated synonyms. It'll just say these are two different features, that's it. It will not communicate any information about these being opposite senses. Uh, and therefore, this is a really useful information to know that two pieces of sentences might be uh, completely different from each other. So again, it's really lacking in com you know capturing the aspects of meanings we care about to do downstream uh, applications. For example, if you have it's hot, cold, and warm, it's through three different sentences, um, we would have... Um, vocabulary of one, two, three, five words, feature vector size would be five, and uh, each one of them would have would start with one, one, but then we would have in the first one, one, zero, zero, in the second one, uh, zero, one, zero, and in the third one, zero, zero, one. And they would see seem equally different, whereas it's hot and it's warm are more similar uh, than it's hot and it's hot, it's cold. So again, bag of word with counts is really lacking in terms of capturing the aspects of meaning we care about for downstream uh, applications. Okay, do we agree with that? Yeah, all right. So now what we are gonna do, I will introduce something called distributional hypothesis, which is going to be a building block for our better feature representation, which will be given by an algorithm or software we call work to vec Okay, so distributional hypothesis, think about it as intuition from which we will build this new way of creating feature um, representations. All right, I'm give, gonna give you an example. Does anyone know what this word is? Perfect. I was not hoping you will know it. Um, I will tell you that this word can appear in these sentences. You can say a cluster of Artemia is floating in the lake. You uh, might say something like this. Biology study the adaptation of Artemia in saline uh, environments. The population of Artemia fluctuates, fluctuates with the salinity of the water. And you can observe Artemia in the shallows of the groin cell plate. Now try to imagine what else could fit here. Just try to brainstorm you know, in your head what other thing could be placed in these uh, lines uh, here. And if you have any idea, Please let us know. Yeah. Algae, perfect, exactly. Yeah. White shrimp, I think this is actually synonym maybe. Okay, great. So we had uh, algae and we have uh, white shrimp. So basically uh, we can now conclude that Artemia might be something like a creature similar to an algae or to a white shrimp, right? Because both Artemia and these other words can fit in this context. So we've concluded something about similarity of these words just based on the fact that they can appear in similar contexts, okay? So some other words, microorganisms or just uh, shrimp. Okay, so this is what I said. 
Given that these other words can occur in the same context, we can conclude that Artemia is a simpler form of life found in aquatic environments like the Great Salt Lake, similar to algae microorganisms and shrimp. So we learned something about similarity of this new word we didn't know about with some other words which are more familiar to us as algae, microorganisms, and shrimp. And this is basically a distribution of hypothesis. It says uh, already in the 50s, it says that words that occur in similar contexts tend to have similar meanings. That's what the distributional hypothesis says. And we are going to use this hypothesis to find vectors uh, that basically realize this. These vectors will be such that words that do appear in the similar meanings, uh, in the similar, the, excuse me, the words that do appear in similar contexts will be represented by vectors, which will be uh, similar to each other. Okay, so let me uh, go over a few, few things one more time. Lexical semantics, I didn't say, is the study, is the linguistic study of word meaning. When you drop lexical and you just say semantics is the study of general meaning. It can be sentences, paraphrases, whatever, uh, paragraphs, whatever. Okay. Vector semantics instantiates distribution of hypothesis by learning vector representations of the meaning of words directly from their distributions in text. Meaning, distributions of text for us means a collection of texts, right? So corpus of texts. And you will say, uh, you will check how these words, in which context they appear, and the words that appear in similar concept will, after our algorithm, be represented by vectors which are close to each other in the learned vector space. I will be using, and everyone uses words, representations and embeddings interchangeably. They are almost like synonyms in our field. When we say representation, we always mean vector representation. And in today with deep learning, it means that these represent representations are learned from data. They are not manually crafted. So very often today, representations, embeddings, synonyms, and used to refer to learn uh, vectors, as we are going to learn how to do uh, do uh, today. Embeddings, historically, the term comes from mathematics. Uh, it's a mapping. Embeddings in mathematics mean, uh, means a mapping from one space or structure to another. And what we are doing is also mapping from discrete space of words into a continuous space of word vectors. That's, that's where this word comes from. Okay, so now we are going to see how to actually do this, how to learn these vectors, which have uh, this property that the, the, the words that appear in similar contexts will be close to each other. Before that, um, I will just uh, contrast uh, representation learning, so learning these representations from data alone, with feature engineering. This is what people were doing uh, before the uh, you know uh, NLP was taken over with uh, word embeddings, which we are going to learn today, and neural networks, where you use machine learning, like you use logistic regression, but then you designed your uh, feature vector by deciding what is an inappropriate feature. For example, we have just used counts as of words as appropriate features, but actually we did way more than just that. We would say, okay, for this task, very important uh, word is a verb. And then it's good to know what is, um, how is verb related to other words in this sentence in terms of grammar. And then you would, you know, just build your feature space and then you would have many, many, uh, many features. And the issue is that yeah, we simply are not as good as creating solutions by rules and you know manually as uh, our algorithms which learn solutions from data. Basically, algorithms that learn solution for the problem from data will almost always have better generalization because we are bounded by how many rules or features we can think about, whereas an algorithm will find the associations between useful features of text and output labels on its own. Okay, so just contrasting these two things, feature engineering with representation learning. All right, so now we are gonna go into uh, learning how to actually create these representations 
Again, these representations, these vectors will be such that words that appear in similar contexts are close to each other in vector space and are otherwise uh, far away from each other. First of all, Vertovec is uh, referring to a software package. And that package has actually two algorithms for doing what I just said uh, we are going to do. Uh, there are Skip Brown with negative sampling, which are going to learn today. And another one is continuous bag of words, which we're not going to cover. Usually today we are, it really is again, another modeling choice, which one of these is better depends on your data. But very often people will uh, end up using Skip Brown with negative sample, which has been shown slightly better in practice. And people will often refer to either Skip Brown or or continuous bag of words as word to back. So you really need to then, if you are interested, which one exactly is it, if it's important to you, you need to check which one it is because both of these will be referred to as word to back. Okay, introduced in 2013, last year, I believe, uh, won the test of time award at the most prestigious machine learning conference, uh, NeoRips. It's really one of those pivotal uh, papers uh, in the field. Okay, so again, uh, I said that the intuition for word to vec will be um, distributional hypothesis. So instead of counting how often each word W occurs near other word parrot, we are going to uh, train a classifier on a binary prediction uh, task, which is going to tell us is word W likely to show up uh, near parrot? And specifically with skip ground, we are going to use the target word and neighboring context words from a corpus as positive examples. We are going to randomly sample other words as negative examples and train a classifier to distinguish these two classes. Okay, so this is just the, I shouldn't have said intuition here. It's not intuition, it's more like a high level overview of what we are gonna uh, do, uh, do right now. We are basically going to start with some vector representation, do some uh, computations with them. And based on these uh, results of these computations, we are going to get some probability that they appear together in a corpus, in a, in a small context uh, window or not. And uh, in this way, we are going to change the numbers that appear in those vectors and the resulting vectors are gonna be uh, the vectors we care about. So this is just a very high level overview, but let, let's go into the details and it's gonna become uh, clearer. Okay, so here is an example. This, let, imagine you start with a huge corpus of let's say Wikipedia texts and you uh, pick one word, let's say here apricot, and you consider the context window of size five meaning you look at two words uh, before that word and two words after that word. And um, <coughs> uh, you want to build a classifier that tells you, given this pair of the target word W and the context word uh, C, you want a classifier that uh, based on their vector representation tells, yes, these two things uh, are likely to appear uh, together in a context middle of size five in a, a corpus. All right, so for each uh, one of these, we want uh, to have that. So apricot, tablespoon, apricot of, apricot jam, apricot A, you want to get the probability of one. All right, so does anyone have an idea of how we could do this given what we have learned, uh, learned so far? Um, I will, I will try to give you a hint. Uh, let's say I tell you again, we are gonna deploy sigmoid. So uh, imagine you have vectors for apricot and tablespoon, uh, and these are good vectors. What could you do to get the probability that they are appearing together? Yeah. That product then, exactly. And then give it as an input to the sigmoid, right? So let's go over why this could be a good solution. So here, 
we know that sigmoid is going to give us high probability if the input to the sigmoid is very high number, right? So that's just the property of the sigmoid function. And we know, maybe we don't know, maybe some of you know that if we take two vectors and we do the dot product between them, that's basically measuring the similarity between these two vectors. So if we, uh, if our goal is that we learn vectors that, um, that um, basically will get the high probability of um, uh, appearing together in this context based on their similarity, then we can use their dot product, apply sigmoid and get the probability of them appearing together. Again, we don't have these uh, vectors yet. We are just, we are trying to learn them. Uh, if you don't know this, I think you should have seen this, but uh, you can measure vector similarity with cosine similarity, which measures the angle between two vectors. It disregards the magnitude of vectors and just cares about the direction. If they are pointing in the same direction, you deem them to be similar, of course. Uh, dot product is also considering the magnitude, not just the, um, uh, the uh, excuse me, direction. Okay, so... We have our word, target word. We have some uh, context word. We know that the similarity of these two words, uh, two vectors representing target and context word is given by their dot products. And we know that if we give to a sigmoid a high number, it's gonna give us probability of one. And if you give it a very small number, it's gonna give us the probability of zero, which is great because now we kind of combine all these ideas. If two vectors are similar, tell us that, you know, if they are similar, then we get the probability of these two words corresponding to these vectors uh, appearing together in the context. So we can kind of merge these ideas. And this is basically then what the uh, skip gram model is, mo modulo that I never told you how we got these vectors. So pretend this, we have these vectors for a moment, then the probability of a word appearing in a context is given by the product of the probabilities of um, the target word appearing with each one of them individually. This is the standard uh, IID assumption in machine learning. We just assume these are independent, although they aren't really. And then the joint probability can be written as the product of pro that probabilities. And here we use the sigmoid function and as always apply the logarithm to turn the product into sum of uh, logarithms. So this is all great, except that uh, these vectors, uh, which uh, when we if multiply, when we do their dot product, uh, if two words are similar, give us high value, we never actually learn them. And we the point is to learn them by assuming they are the parameters, they are the weights we need to change during our uh, gradient descent iterations. So again, you for each target word, basically for any word you have in your big corpus, um, you have uh, a random first, initially a randomly initialized vector, and you assume this vector is um, is uh, corresponding to the weights of your model over here that you are going to change during the uh, gradient descent. Excuse me. Uh, in Skibram, um, they are duplicating um, the vectors for target words and context words. So a word can be both uh, both target word and the context word, and they are learning embeddings for all, both of them separately. But um, then in the end, we are just going to care about the, the target words and ditch the context words. Okay. So important bit here is to embrace that our weights in these models are the actual vectors we want to learn for each word. Is that clear? Okay, let, let's go, let's move forward. And then when we come to the actual end of how we train all of this, I'm gonna stop again and then let's see whether whether things are unclear. I think it's gonna click a little bit more when you see more of what's coming. Okay, so, but so far we have the probability of appearing um, together in, um, 
in a uh, in a small context is given by the sigmoid uh, which is input to the sigmoid is the dot product between the context vector and the word vector and uh, both of these are our weights which we randomly initialize at, in the beginning and now we want to change those weights such that the actual dot products between similar words are high and the dot products between dissimilar words like antonyms are not high. For that, first of all, you always start with a big corpus. Uh, here I've actually listed some text corpora that you can uh, check out just to maybe see some examples of them. I always give example of Wikipedia, Wikitext, uh, but there are many others. And in the original paper, they use an internal Google data set, which consists, they say, of various new articles with uh, 1 billion words, uh, and which results in a vocabulary of six, uh, almost 700,000 words. So for all of these almost 700,000 words, you want to learn this vector. And I didn't say, but uh, you don't want to have that huge dimensionality for this vector, which was previously set to the uh, the, the size of vocabulary. That would mean that for every single word here, you would learn the vector of the size of almost 700,000, which would be an overkill uh, uh, for what we want to do. Usually, initially, what people said is uh, uh, dimensionality of these vectors to be yet another hyperparameter to either 50 or 300. So you have way shorter vectors than what you had with the features vectors we have learned before that you're now implementing in your homeworks. Okay, so first you need uh, what they call positive and negative examples. Positive examples will be uh, those examples uh, of context words and uh, target words that actually appear together in your corpus in a small context window size of let's say five. So uh, for example, pour the milk into, you will have pour and milk being one positive example, the and milk being positive example, into and milk being the, the positive example. And you can on your own practice this if you want later by creating the positive examples from these other uh, words. Negative example on the other hand uh, will be, ideally that was, you would have a corpus where someone have created, for example, for word milk, all the contexts where this word would never appear. But we actually don't have naturally occurring corpora like this. So you need to do a trick to produce um, a negative example, an example of a context word and a target word, which you deem should not appear frequently together in uh, many contexts. The way they do it in this work is very simple. You take your vocabulary and you randomly sample any word and you say this is going to be the uh, uh, example of the context word with the target word that do not appear together. And of course that's going to introduce some noise, but the fact is that usually any pair of words doesn't really occur together in many contexts. So that works. However, they do use a little trick to increase the frequency with which you will sample rare words. Because if a word is rare, then it's intuitive that it doesn't occur with many other words often in a small context. We don't, because in general, it it's, doesn't occur often. So basically they use this equation to uh, sample, um, sample the words to be used as negative examples. Uh, and if by setting this parameter alpha here, you can tweak how much you increase the probability of the rare words. And they will call them noise words. These words you sample to pair them with the target word to create an example of a context um, word and the target word that do not appear together in the context. Okay, so we have our positive and negative examples, and now we need to uh, learn. All right, so this looks a little bit scary. Let's go over it uh, slowly. So you started with a large corpus. You created your positive and negative examples, namely pair of the context and target words that do appear in the corpus and that you hypothesize do not appear together in the, in the small context window in your corpus. 
And you also start for every target word for all of those 700,000 words and for all the context words with a uh, randomly initialized vector of a size either 50 or 300. So you start with this randomly initialized vector. So you will have uh, two times vocabulary, many of these vectors of the dimensionality, something like 50 or 300. And your goal is to change the values in those uh, vectors such that you minimize the following function, which is given by this uh, series of equations. Basically, what you want to do is minimize the negative log likelihood of the positive pair, which we know is the same as maximizing the probability of that pair. So you want, um, you want the probability of the pairs that are truly seen together to be high. And a reminder that these probabilities are given by the sigmoid, uh, where we given the sigmoid the product, uh, dot product of the uh, vectors uh, of the target and the context word. Okay, so maybe skip these two lines. This, this is just uh, rewriting this part. Then you come to this one, which is here. So you are um, minimizing the, the no, uh, logarithm of the sigmoid or the dot product of the vector representing your context word and your target word. Here, you are minimizing the negative uh, log likelihood of seeing, um, uh, or yeah, it's a little bit funky written, but basically you are minimizing, maximizing the probability of the, um, embedding in distance between the target non-context word and, uh, uh, excuse me, I'm, I'm reading this and doesn't work out. So let me try this again. Here, basically you wanna minimize probability that your word, that's not the context word and the target word that they appear together. You wanna minimize that probability. And this is the same as saying, I want to maximize the probability uh, of um, the uh, of uh, these two things being far away from each other in this uh, in this uh, vector space, and you can do that by um, making their dot product as small as possible. So basically, minimizing their dot products. This is all very wordy. It is all to say that you are trying to maximize the similarity between the context and the target word vectors if they are a true pair. So you are want, want to maximize their dot product. And on the other hand, you want to put the vectors of, of words that are not similar far away from each other. So you are trying to uh, minimize the dot product between the context uh, word vector and the vector of your target word. So you both need to uh, maximize some similarity and minimize some uh, similarity to uh, have the vector space that has everything uh, you need. Okay. One thing that's a hyperparameter here is how many uh, negative samples you have. Uh, for a smaller corpus, you need more of them. For a corpus of a size that was used in uh, this uh, original work, something in between two to five will be uh, sufficient. Okay. So that's our uh, our uh, optimization, our our loss uh, objective, training objective, and then uh, we are just going to do the back propagation and to do the um, a gradient updates. So we need a gradient uh, with respect to of our loss function with respect to our vector representing the context word that's actually appearing in the context with the target word. We need the gradient with respect to the each one of the negative uh, context words, namely vectors or words that do not appear in the context with the target word. And you need the gradient with respect to the representation of the target word. And because each one of these vectors are the weights themselves, then you are tweaking their weights by doing the gradient the set update, which is basically take the current representation of these vectors and subtract from them the step size times the gradient. 
So that's what we are doing. Our standard gradient update, and we are doing this as many times we said we are gonna do, and eventually these numbers are gonna change and they will be changing such that the similarity uh, given by dot product of vectors is high for similar words and dissimilar uh, uh, or distant for the, the words that are not similar, which for us means do not appear in similar contexts. Okay, it's been a lot. So tell me what's unclear. I'm sure that's not everything is clear. Um, what are the doubts here? Yes. Okay, so that, that's fine. So stochastic gradient descent in general is given by, uh, you have your loss function, which is this one for us. And given this loss function, you need to calculate uh, the gradients with respect to the weights of your model. For us here, the weights are given, it's all the vectors we are trying to learn. So all the, uh, for each one of these almost 700,000 words we have in our vocabulary, we are learning two vectors, one for its kind of target word vector and uh, one when it's a context word vector. So these are our weights of our model. And the final thing with the uh, gradient descent says, change the weights such that you subtract from them step size times the gradient of the loss of function with respect to those weights. So here we are taking these gradients. These are gradients with respect to the weights, with respect to these vectors. And all we are doing then is we take the current representation of these vectors and subtract step size times these values over here. Yeah. It's a little bit, I think, hard to follow because we don't have the pseudo code for gradient descent. So what I recommend, just go back to that pseudo code and then try to plug what is the loss function in this case, what is the gradient and what are the weights. Uh, it's important to realize that, you know, the weights are these vectors and that at the end of training, what we take are these uh, embeddings, the vectors we learn for our target words. And those are now new representation for each single word. With the feature vector that we have learned before, we didn't learn representations for each word, rather for each you know, piece of text. And to get the representation of an entire text, I'm gonna skip here and come here, you just need to do something with this vector to get one vector. And what's typically done is, for example, average them. So now that we have word embedding for, for example, here, predator is a masterpiece, you can average their word embeddings to get the representation of the entire sentence. So that maybe I should have made it clear earlier, earlier that now we are learning representation of words, not of the entire uh, strings. Yes. So that means that each sentence will be represented by a size of, for the length of your vocabulary? No. So each one of these, uh, what's the size of each one of these with word with the algorithm we just learned? I, I said some values. Yeah, 50 or 300. So each one of these will be this short, uh, short uh, vector. And then we are going to average them, meaning the size is stays the same, which is then again, let's say uh, 50 if we started with 50. You, you had a question? Yeah, my question was just that the values were all the same. Uh -huh. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so it makes it happen. Yeah. So um, I will just put this out there and then maybe explain it uh, next time, but uh, it would not work to, for example, concatenate them, which means stacking them in one gigantic vector of the size four times, let's say 50, which would be 200. And the reason for this is because um, it can only work if you do something called padding, which means padding every sentence to the max allowed size. Otherwise, uh, your next operation is the linear projection and your first uh, matrix for doing that is of the size feature, like whatever is the uh, size of the feature times hidden size that we set. 
But if your feature size is variable, which it would be if we are concatenating them and not considering padding, then uh, matrix vector multiplication wouldn't work. So I see faces are like really confused. I'll go over that uh, again, but write it down. Uh, I don't have my iPad here, so um, uh, it's, a, it's a bit hard to follow. Okay. Let's stop here. Uh, we're gonna split time next time on PyTorch and what's left. Uh, please prepare questions. I know this was a little bit uh, maybe harder to follow. I would love, love to answer them.